over a blurry gray background showing students. Color photos of individuals move onto the screen. Each photo is cut into three horizontal slices and they drop into place one at a time. Phrases moving across the background include attention deficit disorder, traumatic brain injury, health impairments. The title reads Invisible Disabilities and Post-Secondary Education. Amrit has a disability. It's just not obvious to most people and the wheelchair has absolutely nothing to do with it. I have ADD and it's cool. The wheelchair is a temporary aid because Amrit had foot surgery recently. Most people can relate to that. We've all known someone who broke a leg skiing or tripped over the dog and sprained an ankle. It's harder to understand a permanent disability that others can't see, especially when that disability affects how the brain works. I go to a private school, I'm on a scholarship, I'm really smart, so I have no problem learning. I just have a problem focusing on things. Jesse, a college sophomore, also has an invisible disability. I have dyslexia and for me that means a great difficulty with spelling. It means I have difficulty telling directions, so I've been known to go left instead of right or right instead of left. Um, it means that I had a whole lot of difficulty learning to read. A car accident in seventh grade left Laura with some permanent injuries. One of those disabilities is invisible until she explains it. I have a traumatic brain injury. Yeah. <laughs> and so um, with that, there comes a lot of memory issues. Like when I was in the accident, I lost like a lot of vocabulary. I, I, now what I, I have to do is, and which is kind of more difficult for me, is I can't get straight to the point of what I'm trying to express, so I talk my way through it. And like, so with vocabulary, I have to talk my, it's that thing that you drive into right in front of your house, you know, oh, a driveway, you know, like. These are three of the many students on campus who look just like anybody else. In other words, they have disabilities which aren't easily noticed. And sometimes that leads to misunderstandings. You may look at a student and you say, you know, you look like every other student in the class. What do you mean you need note taking? What do you mean you need extra time on the test? So it won't be apparent to the faculty member that a student has a disability, but that disability may impact their participation in the class. Does it go directly through the walls of the heart? Sometimes, students with invisible disabilities are perceived as lacking in intelligence or as just not paying attention. That happened to Nate before he was diagnosed with a learning disability. They look at me and they be like, oh, well, you're faking me, you know, you're playing around, you're just not trying hard enough or something, but I was trying, you know. My father had, had learned, has learned disabilities and actually his mom does too, so there's a history there and my parents kind of wondered if something was going on, but the school kept saying, oh, well, he'll, he's just a little slow, he'll pick, he'll pick it up. So by the end of second grade, I still couldn't read at all. Invisible disabilities include attention deficit hyperactivity disorders, or ADHD, seizure disorders, brain injury, Asperger's syndrome, Tourette's syndrome, learning disabilities, and psychiatric conditions. Students are walking on campus. The number of college students with these types of disabilities continues to grow. And there's a very good chance that we'll be seeing a lot of these students in our classrooms over the years. Now with the, the new wave of psychiatric medications that's out there, students are finding that they're able to concentrate better and, and participate in classroom activities more than ever before. A woman works at a desk. Invisible disabilities may affect the way a student processes, retains, and communicates information. He may not be able to screen out distractions, making it hard to focus. She may not have the stamina for a full class load or be able to interact well with others. And anxiety may make it difficult to take tests or to approach professors with questions. Every person experiences their disability differently. So even students that have the same label or the same diagnosis for their disability are going to have a different experience of that disability. You can't assume that because of the label the student's going to have the same needs. So we want to make sure that we work with every individual on a case-by-case -case basis to figure out what's best for them. Professors may have safety concerns about students with particular disabilities, such as seizure disorders. It might feel like too much responsibility students with seizure disorders often are very well controlled with medication so they're really not going to see frequent seizures in the classroom it is important however for an instructor to know what to do in the event of a seizure 
And if the student discloses and says, I have a seizure disorder, then it's very easy for the disability services officer to talk with them and say, what would you like for your instructor to know? There might also be concerns about psychiatric conditions. What if a student has an outburst? What if his behavior disrupts the class? There is a common myth out there that individuals with mental health issues or psychiatric disorders uh, will present a larger problem to the instructor in the classroom, when in fact that is not the case. We would encourage faculty to refer those students who have some outbursts in class to the counseling center for us to work with them on stress management, appropriate behaviors, just as we would any other student. Familiarity with conditions such as Asperger or Tourette syndrome can help faculty feel more comfortable with a student's occasional lack of social skills. Sometimes students with Asperger's don't have the filter to be able to stop asking questions if there's certain things that they want to know, so they may monopolize a lot of class time. And one of the things that we really try to work on is a signal where the professor can let the student know that you've asked enough questions and I will help you, but it's just not going to be now. The media does a lot to play on Tourette's and for instance, Deuce Bigelow, the second movie, where they, I guess, the, the main guy dated all these uh, people that sort of had problems and one of them had Tourette syndrome but it was one of the most rare cases and she would just scream swear words and so whenever I talk to people that have seen that movie they always say wait Tourette syndrome isn't that where you scream in uh, bad words and I'm like I wouldn't say that it's, it's not like that at all provide appropriate accommodations. Students are in a lecture hall. Students with invisible disabilities may or may not need accommodations in a college classroom. If they do, it's their responsibility to self-disclose, provide documentation of a disability, and request accommodations. However, they may choose not to let anyone know about the disability and just try to make it on their own. A lot of individuals choose not to self-disclose because they feel the pressure and the stress that is relating to it. Uh, in previous years before coming to post-secondary education, a lot of times they are labeled and when they get to us then they feel that this is a brand new day for me and I don't want, no, I don't want anyone to know that I have a disability. That's usually not a recommended course of action. It can be stressful for both the student and the professor. Suzanne Tucker. There are times faculty are frustrated with students because they self-disclose later in the semester. They don't do it at the initial start of the semester. And they often will come to the disabled student service person and say, well, you know, why didn't the student disclose? Why did they wait till they did badly on that first exam? And I think, you know, there's not one answer. Often students, because of the hidden nature of their disability, that risk of having to disclose be judged by their professor is one that help, prevents them from uh, taking that initiative and, and disclosing. College students with disabilities Hi. should contact the Disabled Student day. Services I'm Office on campus day. before they start classes. The staff people there will typically check documentation of the disability, determine appropriate accommodations, and give the student a letter authorizing those accommodations. Biowani. What we look into is how does that disability affect that specific person for that specific class? And then we make a determination of what types of accommodation will be reasonable and what will be appropriate. Not all accommodations are reasonable and not all accommodations are appropriate. An accommodation is not appropriate if it would make a substantial change in an essential element of the curriculum. Alter the course objectives. Impose an undue financial or administrative burden to the institution. Pose a direct threat to the health or safety of others. A student meets with staff. If an accommodation request seems unreasonable, a compromise could be discussed between the professor, the student, and the disabled student services staff. So I was working with a student who had Tourette syndrome, which is a disability that causes her to experience some physical and vocal tics. And this student was working, was taking a chemistry class and was working with a chemistry professor. But the professor was concerned that these physical tics may cause a hazard in the chemistry class, in the laboratory specifically. And so we worked with this professor and the student to get a lab situation that was not going to be a problem for the student. We replaced the glassware with plastic when we could and with Pyrex when we could. And we paired the student with a lab partner 
so that if there was a chemical that the student might have a difficulty handling in case she had a physical tick during the handling of it, the lab partner would handle those specific chemicals and the student was still working in a situation that was safe and she could learn what she needed to learn. Outside. And I'm going to see if I can find those sunspots. Students with disabilities have the right to confidentiality. If a student appears to be struggling in class but hasn't requested accommodations, the professor is not advised to ask if a disability is involved. But there are acceptable ways to offer assistance. With B. It's okay for the professor to call the, the student and say, it seems as if you are struggling with the concept in this class. Is there anything I can do to help you? You could suggest resources on campus, such as tutoring or instructional centers, and include disabled student services as one of those resources. A very good plan is to include a statement on your class syllabus, inviting students to talk with you about any disability-related concerns. For example, you could say, if you wish to discuss academic accommodations, please contact me as soon as possible. This will make students with disabilities more comfortable discussing accommodations. With Suzanne. It's letting students know that you care, that you're open and responsive. And that's one of the biggest barriers that students confront. They want to know that when they approach a faculty member, especially if your disability is one that's not obvious or apparent, that they've got a faculty member who's already invited that disclosure. A student may request accommodations for the classroom, assignments, and exams. Some commonly requested classroom accommodations include seating near the door to allow taking breaks, alternative note-taking such as a tape recorder, note-taker, or a copy of the instructor's notes, early availability of syllabus and textbooks. With Jesse, I use my laptop in class extensively for both notes and things like essay tests. Uh, I'll email them to the professor at the end of the class and so they're in their inbox when they show up in their, in their office afterward. Assignment accommodations include advance notice, additional time for completion, feedback and assistance in planning workflow, choice of written or oral presentation, assistance during hospitalization. With Andrew. I have received extra time from the teachers a reasonable amount of extra time saying that if I don't get this assignment accomplished I have later to get it in. Accommodations for exams include alternate formats such as multiple choice, essay, oral, presentation, role play, or portfolio. Use of adaptive computer software such as speech recognition, extended time for test taking, taking tests in a separate, non-distracting room, a scribe, reader, or word processor for exams. Extra time on tests. I have problems taking tests. That's my major issue is that I can't take tests to the best of my ability. Like I can do the homework, I can study, I can memorize, but I can't take the test very well. For some classes, I'm allowed to take oral tests because I can work my way to the answer and they'll understand that I'm actually saying the right thing. It just, when written, it's like, ah. In some cases, accommodations may extend beyond the classroom. For example, a medical student might eventually need to do clinical work. An individual discussion of options may be necessary. What I would most likely talk about are the technical standards of the program. Can these student meet the technical standards? So sitting with the student who wants to go into the College of Nursing, I may say to them, okay, here are the technical standards for this program. Are you able to perform these standards in order to graduate from the program? Not just participate, but be able to graduate from the program. And included in those technical standards are some of these field work sites, clinical experiences, hands-on aspects of working with patients. Are you able to do that? Apply universal design. In class, a teacher lectures. So it's a good idea to look through the list. Like we're gonna go Good teaching can minimize the need for accommodations. By using principles of universal design in your instruction, you'll maximize learning for all students in your class. When we talk about universal design, we are not talking about something that is out of the ordinary, but it's teaching to a wide variety of individuals. So preparing ahead of time, thinking about the different types of learners that you may have in the class and making sure that those individuals can participate. Universal design strategies are usually not difficult to employ. For instance, as you're designing your course, 
you might think of alternative assignments for students. They might write a paper, they might give a presentation, they might put together a portfolio to meet a requirement in the class. These alternatives work well for students with a variety of learning styles and backgrounds, including those with disabilities. For example, having notes available in a library, having notes available online, uh, having books available and syllabuses available before class starts so students can get, have access to that. Planning your curriculum with universal design can reduce or eliminate the need for accommodations later, and that's helpful for both faculty and students. If you're designing your classwork so that it will be accessible to all students in class, it might take a little bit longer for you to do that initially, but the benefits of it to you as well as to the student will be reaped later because once you've done it, you've done it. You're not going to have to reinvent the wheel. Other elements of universal design which may be particularly helpful to students with invisible disabilities include multiple methods of delivery, including lectures, discussion, hands-on activities, internet-based interaction, and fieldwork. Providing printed materials and electronic resources summarizing or outlining lecture content. Encouraging a variety of ways for students to interact with each other and with you, such as in-class discussion, group work, one-on-one -on -one meetings, and email. Providing feedback periodically as an assignment is being completed. Including questions on tests that require a variety of responses, such as multiple choice and essay. When we adopt the principle of universal design, uh, that minimizes the amount of accommodations that we're going to need. And students who are in the class who have disabilities may not even have to ask for accommodations anymore. Of course, that doesn't mean that we're not going to have anyone requesting accommodation. It will just limit the number of accommodations that we have to provide. Learn from your students. A teacher meets with students. Finally, just listening to students will let you know what they need to be successful in your class. And who knows, they may be teaching your children someday. I want to teach middle school. I want to be a math teacher. And th one of the main reasons I want to teach is because, is, have you ever gone through like, like a problem or something where you're just like, oh, I don't understand what they're talking about. Uh, and then you have that click. And, it, and then you have that huge smile on your face. I want to help kids like get that every day, you know. For more information, contact Do It. World Wide Web, www.washington.edu slash doit. Phone, voice or TTY, area code 206-685-DOIT. 3648. Address, Do It. University of Washington, Box 355670, Seattle, Washington, 98195-5670. Director, Cheryl Bergstaller. The content of this video was developed with funding from the U.S. Department of Education, grant number P333A050064. However, the content does not necessarily represent the policy of the Department of Education and you should not assume the endorsement of the federal government. Copyright 2007, University of Washington.